The problem of Christian prophecy, Christianity always carries within it carries within it a structure of hope. It is increasingly urgent that the authentic structure of promise and fulfillment inherent in the Christian faith be presented in a comprehensive, livable way. Interview with Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, who is now Benedict the Sixteenth, by Niels Christian Hvid. To most theologians, the word prophecy suggests the prophets of the Old Testament, divine favor, the Baptist, John the Baptist, or the prophetic dimension of the magisterium. The theme of prophets is only rarely addressed in the church, and yet the history of the church is packed with prophetic figures, many of whom were not canonized until later, though during their lives they had transmitted the word, not as their own, but as the word of God. There has never been any systematic reflection on the particularity of the prophets, on what distinguishes them from the representatives of the institutional church, and how the word revealed to, by them is related to the almighty word revealed in the anointed king Christ, transmitted to us by the apostles. No theology of Christian prophecy of proper has ever been effectively developed. Indeed, there are very few studies on this problem. Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, Joseph Ratzinger addressed the concept of revelation very early on, his, on in his activity as a theologian and to considerable depth. His abilitation thesis on Die Geschichtstheologie des Heiligen Bonaventura, St. Bonaventura's Theology of History, had had such an innovative impact at the time that it was initially rejected. At that time, and there's a, there are footnotes to it, and we we'll get that later. At that time, the revelation was still conceived as a collection of divine propositions. It was primarily considered a question of rational pieces of knowledge. But in his research, Ratzinger found that in Bonaventura, the revelation refers to the action of God Almighty in history in which the truth is gradually unveiled. The revelation is the continuous growth of the church and the fullness of the logos. It was only after this text was notably cut back and redrafted that it was accepted. Since then, Ratzinger has sustained a dynamic understanding of the revelation in the light of which the word Christ is always greater than any other word, and no other word could ever fully express it. Indeed, words partake of the inexhaustible fullness of the Almighty Word. For the Almighty Word, they open up... And concept of revelation. As far back as 1993, Cardinal Ratzinger was saying that in-depth research was urgently needed to establish what being a prophet means. And this is why he, we asked the Cardinal to meet us to discuss the theme of Christian prophecy. Question one, in the history of the revelation, the Old Testament, it is essentially the word of the prophet that paves the critical way for the history of Prince with God, Israel, accompanying it throughout. Was what is your thinking of prophecy in the life of the church? Joseph Ratzinger says, first of all, let's dwell for a moment on prophecy in the Old Testament. To avoid any misunderstanding, it should be clearly established who the prophet really is. The prophet is never a soothsayer. The essential element of the prophet is not the prediction of future events. The prophet is someone who tells the truth on the strength of his contact with God Almighty. The truth for today, which also naturally sheds light on the future, it is not the question of foretelling the future in detail, but of rendering the truth of God Almighty present at this moment in time and appointing us in the right direction. As far as Prince with God Israel is concerned, the word of the prophet has a particular function in that, in the sense that the faith is essentially understood as hope in him who will come. For a word of faith is always the realization of the faith, especially in its structure of hope. It leads hope on and keeps it alive. It is equally important to underline that the prophet is not apocalyptic, though he may seem apocalyptic. Essentially, he does not describe the ultimate realities, but helps us to understand and live the faith as hope. Even if at a moment in time the prophet must proclaim the word of the Almighty, the Almighty word of God Almighty, as if it were a sharp sword, he is not necessarily criticizing organized worship and institutions. His mandate is to counter the misunderstanding and abuse of the Almighty Word, an institution by running God Almighty's vital claim ever present. However, it would be wrong to reconstruct the Old Testament as antagonistic dialectics between the prophets and the law. Given that both come from the Almighty, they both have a prophetic function. This is a very important point to, to my mind because it leads us into the New Testament. At the end of Deuteronomy, the book of the law, Drawn out, Moses is presented as prophet, and he too presents himself as such. He tells Prince with God, Israel, the Almighty God will send you a prophet like me. What does a prophet like Moses mean? Again, according to 
the book of the law, Deuteronomy, and I think this is the decisive point, drawn out Moses' particular lay, particularity lay in the fact that he spoke with the Almighty God as with a friend. I tend to see the node or the root of the prophetic element in that face-to-face -face with God and talking with him as with a friend. Only by virtue of this direct encounter with God Almighty may the prophet speak in moments of time. Now, how can the concept of prophecy be related to Christ, the anointed king? May the anointed king, Christ, be described as a prophet? Ratzinger says, the fathers of the church conceived of the above prophecy in Deuteronomy as a promise of Christ, the anointed king, something I agree with. Drawn out, Moses says, a prophet like me. He transmitted the almighty word, he transmitted the word to prince with God Almighty Israel, and he made it a people. With his face to face with the Almighty God, he fulfilled his prophetic mission by leading men to their encounter with God Almighty. All the other prophets are in the service of this prophecy and must always deliver the law anew from rigidity and transform it into a pathway of life. The true and greater Moses drawn out is, therefore, Christ, the anointed king himself, really, uh, who really does live the face to face with God Almighty because he is his Almighty Son. In this bond between Deuteronomy and the event of Christ, the anointed king, we can glimpse a very important point for understanding the unity of the two testaments. The anointed one, Christ, is the definitive and true drawn out Moses, who really does live face to face with God as son. He no longer simply leads us to the Almighty through the word and the precepts, but brings us with him by his life and his passion and by the incarnation he take, makes us body of the anointed king. This means that prophecy is also radically present in the New Testament. If Christ, the anointed king, is the definitive prophet because he is the almighty son, then the Christological anointed king-centered prophetic dimension also enters into the New Testament because of the communion with the all-powerful son. Now, the next question is, it's not in bold, but it should be, how do, how do you think this emerges in a concrete way in the New Testament? Doesn't the death of the last apostle put a definitive stop to further prophetic claims, excluding any such possibility? Ratzinger says, yes, there is a thesis whereby the fulfillment of the revelation marked the end of all prophecy. I think this thesis harbors a double misunderstanding. First of all, it harbors the idea that the prophet, who is essentially associated with the dimension of hope, has no further function for no other reason than Christ, the anointed one, is now with us so that hope has given way to presence. This is an error because the anointed one, Christ, came in the flesh and then rose again in the Holy Almighty Spirit. This new presence of the anointed king in history, in the sacrament, in the word, in the life of the church, in the heart of every man, is the expression and beginning of the definitive advent of the anointed king, Christ, who fills all things. This means that Christianity always tends towards the self-existent Lord who comes in an interior movement. This still happens now, through in a different, though in a different way, because the anointed king is already here. However, Christianity always carries a structure of hope within it. The Eucharist was always conceived as our going to the Lord who comes. It therefore, rep it therefore represents the whole church. The concept that Christianity is already a totally complete presence and that it does not carry any structure of hope within it is the first error to be rejected. The New Testament has a different structure of hope within it, but it is still always a radical structure of hope. And the new people of God is therefore essential to be the servant of that hope. The second misunderstanding is the reductive intellectual type of conception of the revelation, seen as a treasure of pieces of knowledge transmitted to which nothing more can be added, totally complete. The authentic event of the revelation consists in the fact that we are introduced to the face-to-face -face with the Almighty God. The revelation is essentially God Almighty who gives himself to us, who constructs history with us, and who reunites us together, us gathering us all together. It is the unfolding of an encounter which has also an inherent communicative dimension and a cognitive structure. This also carries implications for knowledge of the truth of revelation. Understood in the proper way, the revelation has attained its goal with Christ because in those beautiful words of St. John of the Cross, when God Almighty has spoken personally, there is nothing more to add. Nothing more about the Logos can be said. He is among us in a complete way, and the Almighty has nothing greater to give us, to say to us than himself. But this very wholeness of God Almighty giving of himself, that is that he, the Logos, is present in the flesh, also means that we must continue to penetrate this mystery. This brings us back to the structure of hope. 
the coming of the anointed king, Christ, is the beginning of an ever-deepening knowledge and of a gradual discovery of what in the Logos is being given. Thus, a new way is inaugurated a leading man into the whole truth. As eternal Savior puts it in the Gospel of John, who says that the Holy Almighty Spirit will come down. I believe that the pneumatological Christology of the eternal Savior's leave-taking discourse is very important to our theme given that Christ explains that his coming in the flesh was just the first step. The real coming will happen when the anointed king Christ is no longer bound to place or to body locally limited, but when he comes to all of us in the spirit of the risen one. So in entering into the truth, we also acquire more and more profundity. It seems clear to me that considering that the time of the church, that is the time when Christ comes to us in spirit, is determined by this very pneumatological Christology. The prophetic element as element of hope and appeal cannot naturally be lacking or allowed to fade away. The next question, how is this element present? How does it present itself, for example, in St. Paul? Ratzinger says, in Paul it is particularly evident that his apostolate, being a universal apostolate directed at the entire pagan world, also incorporates the prophetic dimension. Because of his encounter with the risen Christ, anointed king, he unlocks for us the mystery of the resurrection and leads us into the profundity of the gospel. Because of this encounter, he develops a new understanding of the word of Christ highlighting the aspect of hope and bringing out its critical potential. Being an apostle is, of course, something unrepeatable. The question here is, then, what happens in the time of the church when the apostle apostolic epoch ends? Okay. A passage from the second chapter of the lecture to the Ephesians is very important in answering this question. Paul writes that the church is founded upon the apostles and prophets. It was once thought that the apostles were meant the twelve and the prophets those of the Old Testament. Modern exegesis tells us that the concept of apostle must be understood in a broader sense and that the concept of prophet should be referred to the prophets in the church. The twelfth chapter of the first letter to the Corinthians teaches us that the prophets of those days constituted a college. The same thing is mentioned by the Didache, in which this college is still very clearly present. Later, the college of the prophets dissolved this institution, and certainly not by chance, since the Old Testament already shows us that the function of the prophet cannot be institutionalized. The criticism of the prophets is not just directed at the priests, but also against the institutionalized prophets. This emerges from very clearly in the book of the prophet Amos, Amos, where he speaks out against the prophets of the kingdom of Israel, prince with God. The prophets often speak out against the prophets' institution because the place of prophecy is eminently the place the Almighty God reserves for himself to intervene personally and anew each time taking the initiative. Therefore, this space cannot properly subsist in the form of a college institutionalized once again. I think it should subsist in a dual form, as has always been the case, after all, in the history of the church. As far as the first form is concerned, the prophetic claim should always be acknowledged in the apostolic college in the same way as the apostles themselves were prophets too, in their own way. This so that it is not just the present that is highlighted in the church, but so that the Holy Spirit proper may always have the possibility of action. This can be observed in the history of the church in great figures such as Gregory the Great and Augustine. We could mention other names of great personages who held office within the church and who were also prophetic figures. For this, we see that the institutional figures themselves hold these men, hold the door open for the Holy Spirit. It was only by doing, so doing that these men were able to fulfill their office in a prophetic way, as, Didac, as the Didache puts it very well. The second form in Visage is God Almighty, who, through charisms, reserves for himself the right to intervene directly in the church to awaken it, warn it, promote it, and sanctify it. I believe that this prophetic charismatic history traverses the whole time of the church. It is always there, especially at the most critical times of transition. Think, for example, of the birth of monarchism, constituted, or monasticism, constituted in the beginning by the retreat of Anthony Abbott to the desert. The monks were the ones who saved Christology, the, the understanding of who Christ is, from Arianism and Nestorianism. Basil is another of the, these figures, a great bishop, and at the same time, a true prophet. Later, it is not hard to see a charismatic origin in the movement of the mendicant friars and mendicant orders. Neither Dominic 
nor Francis prophesied the future, but they did understand that the moment had come for the church to shake free of the feudal system to give new value to the universality and poverty of the gospel and to apostolic life. By so doing, they gave the church its true face back. To have a church fired, filled with the fire of the Holy Almighty Spirit and led by the anointed king himself. They represent a new beginning, and they thus brought about the reform of the ecclesiastical hierarchy. Other examples are Catherine of Siena and Brigid of Severia, Sweden, two great female figures. I think it is very important to stress how, at a particularly difficult time for the church, such as the Avignon crisis and the schism that ensued, female figures rose up to emphasize the anointed king Christ's claim, the Christ who lives and suffers in his church. Now we're going on to the next page. And we're waiting. The next page to show up. This is uh excerpt of what Ratson said, written on the True Life in God website. Still loading. Now, the, the problem of Christian prophecy continues. If we look at the history of the church, it becomes clear that most of the mystic prophets were women. This is a very interesting fact that could assist the discussion on women priests. What do you think? Ratzinger says, there is an ancient patristic tradition that calls Mary, the mother of God Almighty, not priestess, but prophetess. The title prophetess in the pit the title prophet of prophetess in the patristic tradition is Mary's supreme title. It is in Mary that there is a precise definition of what prophecy really is. That is, the intimate capacity to listen to, perceive, feel, that allows one to sense the consolation of the Holy Almighty Spirit, accepting him within oneself, making him fruitful, bringing him fruitful into the world. It might be said, in a sense, that without wishing to be categorical, that it is none other than the Marian line that represents in the church the prophetic dimension. Mary, the mother of God, has always been seen by the fathers of the church as the archetype of the Christian prophet, and it is from her that the prophetic line comes then to enter into the history of the church. The sisters of the great saints also all belong to this south line. Saint Ambrose owes much to his, law, to his holy sister, for the spiritual pathway he embarked upon. The same holds for Basel and Gregory of Nyssa and for St. Benedict. Further on, in the late Middle Ages, we meet some great female figures, and of them we must mention Francesca Romana. In the 16th century, Teresa of Avila was very determinant for John of the Cross, and more generally, for the entire development of faith and devotion. The prophetic female line was of great importance in the history of the Church. Catherine of Siena and Brigid of Severia could be an illustration. Both addressed a church which had an apostolic college and where sacraments were administered. So the essential things were still there, however, threatened with decadence because of internal conflicts. They reawakened the church, and in it, they restored value to evangelical unity, humility, and courage, and to the evangelization. Then you said that the definitiveness, which does not have the same meaning as conclusive, conclusion, of the revelation in Christ is not definitive in terms of propositions. This affirmation is of great interest to the theme of Christian prophecy. One might legitimately ask to what degree the prophets might have something radically new to say in the history of the church and as regards theology itself. It seems that most of the last great dogmas may be placed in proven direct relation to the revelations of the great prophet saints, such as those of Catherine Labouré, as far as the dogma of the Immaculate Conception is concerned. This is a rather little explored theme in the books of theology. We could also mention... Um, Lourdes, France. Ratzinger says, yes, this theme, these theme has still to be addressed to any real depth. It seems to me that von Balthasar highlighted how behind every great theologian there was all, has always been a prophet first. Augustine is unthinkable without the encounter with mon monasticism, especially with Anthony Abbott. The same, or Abbott Anthony, the same holds for Athanasius. Thomas Aquinas, Aquinas would not be conceivable without Dominic without the charism of the evangelization proper to him. Reading his writings, one notes how important this theme was for him. This theme played an important role in his dispute with the secular clergy and with the University of Paris, 
where he was summoned to reflect on the motivations for the way he lived. He said that the true rule of his order was found in the sacred scriptures and that it is constituted by the fourth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. The whole group was united heart and soul. And by the tenth chapter of the gospel, the whole group was united heart and soul. And none dare say that anything he possessed was his own, but they shared with everyone in need. And that by the tenth chapter of the gospel of Matthew, proclaim the gospel without claiming anything for yourself. For Thomas, this is the rule of all rules. Any monastic form can but be the realization of this original model, which naturally is of an apostolic nature, but, with the pro which, but which the prophetic figure of Dominic made him rediscover in a new way. From the basis of this initial model, Thomas, and de Thomas develops his theology on evangeliza as evangelization. Um, from the basis of this initial model, Thomas develops his theology as evangelization, that is, as going around with and for the gospel, being rooted at first start in the unity, heart and soul of the community of believers. The same could be said of Bonaventura and Francis of Assisi. The same holds for Hans Urs von Balthasar, who is unthinkable without Adrian von Speyer. I believe that it can be proven that for all the great theologians, any new theological elaboration is only possible if the prophetic element has first paved the way. While one proceeds with the mind only, nothing new will ever happen. Increasingly, more definite systems may well be construed, increasingly subtle questions raised, but the true and proper way from which great theology may get, again flow is not generated by the rational side of theological work, but by a charismatic and prophetic thrust. And it is in this sense, I believe, that prophecy and theology go hand in glove. Theology, as theological science in the strict sense, is not prophetic, but may only truly become living theology under the thrust and illumination of a prophetic impulse. The Creed says that the Holy and Almighty Spirit has spoken through the prophets. Are the prophets those of the Old Testament or only, or is this also a reference to those of the New? Ratzinger answers, to answer that question, one should study the history of the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed in depth. Undoubtedly, here the reference is to Old Testament prophets only. See the use of the prefect tense, has spoken. I mean, you see the use of the perfect tense, has spoken to the prophets. And so, as such, the pneumatological dimension of the revelation is strongly brought out. The Holy and Almighty Spirit proceeds, precedes the anointed king and prepares the way for him to then introduce all men to the truth. There are various professions of faith, in which this dimension is strongly brought out. In the tradition of the Eastern Church, the prophets are considered to be an ec economy of preparation on the part of the Holy and Almighty Spirit, who is already speaking before Christ comes, and he who speaks in the first person through the prophets. I am convinced that the primary accent is placed on the fact that it is the Holy Spirit, the Almighty, who opens the door for the anointed king to be accepted, ex spiritu sancto. What happened in Mary, by the action of the Holy Almighty Spirit, ex spirito sancto, is an event that was under careful preparation for a long time. Mary reassumes in herself the whole prophecy as the entire economy of the Almighty Spirit. The providence ex spirito sancto of the whole prophecy is then concentrated in her in the anointed king's conception. To my mind, this does not exclude the ulterior prospect that the anointed king is always conceived anew Ex Spiritu Sancto. St. Luke himself set the story of eternal Savior's childhood on a parallel with the second chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, which speaks to us of the birth of the church. In the circle of the twelve apostles gathered around Mary, the Conceptio Ex Spiritu Sancto comes about, and it happens again in the birth of the church. For this reason, it might be said that if the text of the Creed also refers only to the Old Testament prophets, it does not mean that the economy of the Holy Spirit may be said to be concluded or ended or finished. And then the next one, John the Baptist is often indicated as the last of the prophets. How should that be interpreted in your view? Ratzinger says, I think there are numerous reasons for it in many respects. One such is what eternal Savior himself said. It was towards John that all the prophecies of the prophets and of the law were leading. Then the kingdom of God will come. Here, the Savior himself is declaring John to be a conclusive point, and that afterwards, someone apparently less grand will come, who is in reality the greatest in the kingdom of God, which is to say, eternal Savior himself. With these words, the Baptist is still kept within the Old Testament framework, but as such, he represents the key to the door of the new covenant. In this sense, the Baptist is the last of the Old Testament prophets. There, this is also the proper understanding of John, who is the last before Christ. 
He who carries the flame of the whole prophetic movement and hands it to Christ, the anointed king. He brings to completion all that the prophets did so that in the anointed king hope would be born. He thus concludes the work of the prophets in the Old Testament sense. It is important to specify that he himself does not present himself as a soothsayer, but simply as one who calls people prophetically to conversion and who is therefore renewing and updating the messianic promise of the Old Testament. Of the Messiah, he says, standing among you is one unknown to you whose sandals are not worthy to untie and loose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Even if this proclamation does not, even if this proclamation does contain a prediction, John remains faithful to the prophetic model, which is not to foretell the future, but to announce that the time has come to convert. John's appeal is invitation to Israel, Prince with God, to return to itself and convert in order to recognize at the hour of salvation him whom Prince with God has always expected and who is now here. John personifies, therefore, the last of the prophets of the past and then the specific economy of hope of the Old Testament. What will come after will be another type of prophecy. For this reason, the Baptist may be called the last of the Old Testament prophets. This does not mean, however, that after him the prophecy is finished, for this would conflict with St. Paul's teaching when he says in the first letter to the Thessalonians, Do not stifle the spirit or despise the gift of prophecy. In a certain sense, there is a difference between the prophecy of the New and Old Testament for the very fact that Christ entered into history. But if one looks at the very essence of prophecy, which is to instill in the church the word heard from God, there appears to be no difference at all. Ratzinger says, yes, the difference with effectively a basic common structure. The difference lies in the way of relating to Christ as to him who, who comes, to him who has already come, or who has still to return. The reason why the time of the church on the structural plane is the same as the Old Testament, or at least very similar, and in which its newness lies, deserves to be studied, gone into further. One often sees in theology the tendency to radicalize the differences between the Old and New Testaments. This way of presenting the differences often appears artificial based on abstract principles as opposed to factual elements. Reisinger says, radicalizing the differences without wanting to see the intimate unity of the history of the Almighty God with men is an error which the fathers of the church did not make. They proposed a tripartite schema, umbra, imago, veritas, in which the New Testament is the imago, thus the Old and New Testaments are, are not set in opposition to one another as shadow and reality, but within the triad of shadow, image, and reality. The expectation of the definitive fulfillment is kept alive, and the time of the New Testament, the time of the church, is seen as an ulterior plane, a more elevated one, but still on the pathway of the promise. There's a point which, to date, it seems to me, has not been given sufficient consideration. The fathers of the church stressed with force the intermediate nature of the New Testament, in which not all the promises have been fulfilled yet. Christ came in the flesh, but the church still awaits his full revelation in glory. The next question, perhaps this is another reason why the spirituality of many prophetic figures bears an eschatological mark. Ratzinger says, I think, without conceding anything to infatuation with things apocalyptic, that this essentially belongs to the prophetic nature. The prophets are the ones who bring out Christianity's dimension of hope. They are the channels of access to what must still come to pass and therefore allowing us to go beyond time to attain what is essential and definitive. This eschatological character, this starts to go beyond time, is certainly part of the prophetic spirituality. If we set prophetic eschatology in relation to hope, the picture changes completely. It's no longer a message that instills fear, but one that opens up a horizon on which the entire creation promise to Christ is fulfilled. Give birth and have your son. That the Christian faith does not inspire fear, but overcomes it is a fundamental fact. This principle must constitute the basis of our testimony and of our spirituality. But let's go back for a moment to what we said earlier. Give birth to the era of peace. Oh, church, it is of extreme importance to specify in which sense Christianity is the fulfillment of the promise and in which sense it is not. I believe that there is a close tie between the current crisis of faith and the insufficient clarification of this question. There are three inherent dangers here. The first is that the promises of the Old Testament and the expectation of the salvation of men are seen only in an imminent way in the sense of new and better structures of perfect effectiveness. Conceived in this way, Christianity proves to be just a defeat. From this basic perspective, there has been an attempt to replace Christianity with ideologies of faith in progress and then with ideologies of hope, which are just variations of Marxism. The second danger is to see Christianity as something solely associated with the afterlife, something purely spiritual and individualistic, thus negating the totality of the human reality. The third danger, particularly menacing at times of crisis and struggle 
turning points is to take refuge in infatuations with things apocalyptic. In opposition to all this, it is increasingly urgent that the authentic structure of promise and fulfillment inherent in the Christian faith is presented in a comprehensive and livable way. That's it. One more. 